when you drive down Interstate 5 between San Francisco and Los Angeles, uh, you see cotton fields, miles and miles of cotton fields, and you see row crops, and you see orchards, and you think, oh, there's some cotton, there's some orchards, there's some row crops. This just wouldn't have been possible within the pre-existing natural order. The water is coming from hundreds of miles away through concrete rivers. You know, it just couldn't have happened without these fancy waterworks that we know, which are all but invisible. Somewhere off in the distance is a huge aqueduct carrying water that sustains all of this. But if it somehow the water stopped flowing, you'd have a desert again overnight. Everybody is conscious of water. If you head for the river with a bucket, empty bucket, you're liable to get shot. So. <laughs> water makes wealth. Water can turn a low value piece of property into something you can grow lettuce on. There would just be a dry desert here, really. Water brings everything. Water brings the green. Out here, it's, it's man-made compared to uh, Mother Nature, the way you're doing it back east. This looks like garlic over here. Here's a young almond orchard over here. Right now, we've got a field here that's ready for planting for something, probably cotton or tomatoes. These are pistachio trees here. More lettuce over here and garlic over here. See this bronco right here, this tough grass you see on the edge of the road? This is the way it would have looked uh, 100 years ago, before water. 10,000 trucks a day haul food to market on Interstate 5, hundreds of miles through the heart of California. For nearly a century, congressmen, governors, presidents, and farmers have fought bitterly to make nature do their bidding here on the San Joaquin Plains. They have made the Central Valley the richest agricultural region in the history of the world. Here, it is drier than North Africa. And to bring water to this dry land, we built the world's largest and most expensive waterworks. the most completely transformed landscape of its size anywhere on Earth, transformed entirely by water. Here, we churn out a quarter of America's food. How did we achieve this? And why did generations of Americans fight over this land where it never rains in summer? Sierra Nevada rivers to the east have flooded a few weeks each spring since the beginning of time. Snowmelt thundered down rivers teeming with salmon and fed the great swamps and hundred-mile lakes. Every summer, the marshes evaporated. The valleys shimmered in withering heat. It was the American Serengeti. This whole area was known as the Huron Sinks. It was kind of a swampy type thing with water inlets, just, uh, not very deep, but moving in and out. Uh, that's where the Indians camped. And they would do some fishing, oddly enough, hard to believe today. The Indians, uh, they were there during the winter months, and then they'd hightail it over where it was cooler in the summer, over toward the Sierras. The valley's natural web of life had evolved over thousands of wet winters and dry summers. In a few game reserves, bits of the original valley survived to this day. Unbelievable numbers of waterfowl. 80 to 100 million ducks and geese would winter on the flyway. You know, it's an old cliche, but the, the sky was black. I've heard it from people still alive. The sky was black with birds. There were grizzly bears all over the place. And there were um, antelope, million antelope, tule elk. You can find here and there tiny, tiny little pockets of what it once was. 
it was just phenomenal. It's completely and irrevocably and utterly transformed now. The Central Valley has one huge drawback. It stops raining in most years in April or May, and it starts raining again in November. And then when it does rain, it rains like crazy. In 1862, after uh, the town of Sonora got 78 inches of rain in six weeks, the Central Valley was a lake the size of Lake Ontario. It was 250 miles long and 40 miles wide, and it was underwater. The only way to get from San Francisco to Sacramento was by boat. Sacramento was completely underwater in 1850 and again in 1862. From the moment that flood receded, the politicians, the state legislature, said we have simply got to do something to control nature here or we can't continue to live here. And that was really the beginning of the uh, transformation of the valley. A 19th century law allowed anyone to claim land over which he could sail in a boat. Henry Miller staked out his claims for section of land in a boat. He was uh, just another one of those Californians who came here from somewhere else, reinvented himself completely. He'd been a butcher boy. He would float around and mark, drive posts in the ground and mark his territory and the law required it to be done from a boat. So that's just what he did. And then when the flood went away, why, according to history, he put a boat in a buckboard wagon. And then had it pulled by a team of horses on a buggy or wagon and went traipsing across the country a considerable distance. Whose empire ultimately reached 1,090,000 acres. For his era, you'd have to take your hat off to him. And he was the first person to build a dam, a significantly sized dam in California. And that led to 1,200 other dams uh, of significant size that we've built since then. In the late 19th century, pioneers built small dams drained marshes, and dug canals. But still, they found themselves at the mercy of nature. The dry farmers looked to the skies and the heavens for rain. They hoped that the rains would be timely enough to, to get a crop. Uh, obviously, it was risky. And if they got into a reasonably wet cycle, they could do reasonably well. It's a lot of praying. With a lot of praying. They sent their wives to church, I know, every Sunday. 